The Deseret Book Audio Library presents S. Michael Wilcox and a talk entitled How Will I Know? Making the Marriage Decision. This talk was recorded in front of a live audience. And now, Michael Wilcox and How Will I Know? Well, I've had the opportunity of working with college students for roughly 30 years now. It's a wonderful age. I, I love it. I feel very, very privileged to be able to teach college students and watch them grow through a, a wonderful age. In a perfect world, if I ever get to create my own, I'm going to have you go from elementary school right into college. <laughs> Just eliminate junior high and, and high school. And over those years, I've had a lot of questions asked by college students, young adults, young single adults. Questions about doctrine, questions about prayer. But if I were to single out one question, I think more than any other question that they have asked me and that we have discussed in classes and private conversations, we could state it in maybe four words. How will I know? How will I know I'm making the right decision about whom I plan on spending eternity with. And young people understand the importance of that decision. The importance of it is reflected in the very first marriage between Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were given four commandments. Don't eat forbidden fruit, multiply and replenish the earth, and have dominion, and stay together. Now how do we know that was a commandment? Because when Adam talked with the Lord, about why he had partaken the forbidden fruit, he stated, the woman thou gavest me and commanded that she should remain with me. So there was a commandment to stay together in the Garden of Eden. They understand the importance of that. They understand the great challenge it is to take two people and bring them together. They want a remain with me marriage. That's what they want. And that's a great challenge to take two personalities, two genders, two different kinds of characteristics and bring them together. For the Lord to say to me as a husband, Michael, you need to treat your wife in such a way that separation from you would be an agony to her. And he would say to my wife, Laura, you need to treat Michael in such a way that separation from you would be an agony to him. And that's a great challenge, but probably the supreme accomplishment of life. I have a very good friend whose wife is a Relief Society president. He watches her prepare her Relief Society lessons, and they, she puts out the lace tablecloths and the flower arrangements. So not to be outdone, he decided that he needed to do something similar for the elders' quorum. But he wanted it to be kind of masculine, so he came into Elder's Quorum one day and threw a blue tarp over the table <laughs> and put a set of deer antlers on it. <laughs> so the challenge we are looking for is you've got to get the blue tarp antler personality and the flower lace tablecloth personality and bring those two people and make them one. Hence the question, how will I know that the person I've chosen the person who's chosen me, we can form that eternal relationship with. For the sake of discussion, uh, I'd like to divide marriage decision into two, two sections. Preparation and the actual deciding, just for the sake of, a, of an approach. There are five observations I would make about the preparation period that I've learned as I've watched these young people work with this and struggle with it and, and hope for it long. Observation one, create the magnet and create it strong. Create the magnet and create it strong. One of the primary functions of the preparation period is to create that magnet. We sometimes talk about magnetic personalities and we all want one. Well, we all do have a magnetic personality and we get to determine the kind of magnet that we are going to put into that personality. Occasionally I will ask the students, uh, would you like a scriptural description of your future spouse? 
and they always want that. And we turn to section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the 40th verse, and here's what the Lord says. Intelligence cleaveth unto intelligence. Wisdom receiveth wisdom. Truth embraceth truth. Virtue loveth virtue. Light cleaveth unto light. Mercy hath compassion on mercy and claimeth her own. Justice continueth its course and claimeth its own. Notice those wonderful verbs. Cleaveth, receiveth, embraceth, loveth, hath compassion, claimeth. Now what the Lord is stating here is an eternal principle that likes attract. If I want a certain kind of personality or characteristics or quality in the person that I'm hoping to marry, maybe the focus of my thought shouldn't be so much on here's what I expect of them, here's what I hope they'll bring to the relationship, but I'm going to focus on myself and what I'm creating in my own character, my own qualities. I have to create the magnet and create it strong that is going to draw that person towards me. If I want intelligence, I have to radiate intelligence. If I want mercy, I have to be merciful. And every other quality or characteristic that we may want. Here are some things I think young people ought to consider and that I've watched them consider over the years. We should consider manners, civility, control of temper, development of the mind, of talents, testimony, financial responsibility, and good common sense. Educational goals, refinement in dress, modesty, cultivation of good taste in music, literature, movies, other forms of entertainment. Learn how to work, how to cooperate, how to pray, understand the scriptures, be patient with children, communication skills, you can't always have your own way, how to compromise, how to forgive, to be kind, to stay physically fit, how to watch our appearances, how to share, good humor, the list can go on and on and on. Sometimes when we make those lists, we make them in, this is what I would like my mate to have. I think Section 88 is saying, if these are things you want them to have, then you need to create the magnet that will draw those qualities to you. And the magnet that you create is the development and cultivation of those same qualities in yourself. Create the magnet and create it strong. Second observation of this preparation time before we have to make the actual decision. Get the two great questions of life in the right order. Now I think there's two great questions in life all of us need to ask. The first is, where am I going? The second is, who's going with me? And it's extremely important that you get those in the right order. You don't want to say, who's going with me, get on a road with that person and discover that you're going in different directions. And occasionally I've seen young people make that mistake. I have to have firmly established in my mind, I am going to the celestial kingdom. That's the road I'm on. Now that I know that's the road I'm on, who's going with me? And I will look along the road that I'm traveling for others who are traveling that same road. Every good thing in life is on that road. Sometimes the person that we're going to go with isn't there as quickly as we would like them to be there. Sometimes the young people want say to the Lord, if you could just put that person about age 23, I'd like to get through college, maybe travel a little bit, get a good job, and if you could put him right there or her right there on the path, I would be very, very grateful. And sometimes they're on the path much sooner than that. And sometimes we look down the path with straining eyes and we don't see them at all. And we say, Lord, I don't see him. I don't see her. And the Lord says, let me give you some binoculars. (laughs) And we look far down that path. 
Every good thing in life is on the path. Get those great questions in the right order. Where am I going and who's going with me? Third observation. Begin your marriage like Adam and Eve began their marriage. Now, how did Adam and Eve begin their marriage? This has to do with the preparation time. We have a very insightful single little verse that tells us something about pre-Adam and Eve marriage, we might say. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, we can read that literally. And whether or not Adam and Eve were literally naked in the Garden of Eden or not is not a, a concern, right? It's the figurative meaning, the lesson that is inherent in that phrase that I want to focus on. God often uses outward physical things to teach spiritual lessons. And being clothed or being naked is one of those outward physical things he uses. Most of us who are normal would not want to go out and let people see us without our clothes on. We would cover ourselves up. We would, we would hide if we ever found ourselves in a situation like that. The Lord is simply saying, take that idea and apply it to spiritual, ethical, moral things. When people do things they're ashamed of, that they don't want people to see, things that are wrong, we cover it up, right? We talk about Washington cover-ups. Even in our open age, celebrities of different kinds, even they don't want things they do to be seen always by the public. So we take that particular idea and apply it to spiritual things. Now, if I read that verse, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were unashamed. Essentially, this is what they are saying to each other as they come to the marriage altar in the Garden of Eden. Adam is saying to Eve, Eve, you can know everything about me. I'm not hiding anything. I'm not covering up anything. There isn't anything in my life I'm afraid you're going to discover about me. I am unashamed and naked before you. And Eve could say to Adam the same thing, Adam, I am naked before you. I'm not hiding anything. There isn't anything in my past I'm ashamed of or afraid that you're going to discover. Put as bluntly as we could say, begin your marriage naked and stay naked the whole time. During my marriage, if there was ever anything I would do that I would think, ooh, I hope my wife doesn't find out about that, or in my single years, I would say, well, I hope my future companion never learns this about me, or that I have done this thing, those would be things to avoid. Because I want to kneel at that altar and look at that individual unashamed. Now, for most of us, that's going to take some repentance. And the atonement is a necessary aspect of that. Observation four. Expect to water camels. That's for the girls. Or be prepared to labor seven years. That's for the boys. Genesis is a very good book to look at things about families. We get some wonderful marriages to look at. Adam and Eve, we've already kind of talked about it, a very powerful lesson we can learn from them. But you can learn by watching Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel. So let's look at something about Jacob and Rachel and Rebecca and Isaac. In Genesis 24, Abraham is concerned about the proper marriage partner for his son Isaac, and he sends his servant on a long journey to find Rebekah. The servant is very concerned about making the right decision because he wants for Isaac a remain with me marriage. That's what he wants. And he's concerned that the girl that is chosen have the right qualities. So when he gets to the well, and everybody in the Old Testament seems to find their best partner at the well. Occasionally I tell the students at the Institute, 
the boys, if you want to find the best girls, you kind of hang around the drinking fountain because <laughs> that's where they come. He goes by the well and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And he designs not a sign as much as a test to find the proper mate for Isaac. Let it come to pass, he prays, that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. So I'm gonna ask the girl for a drink, and she'll give me drink. But then she needs to volunteer to water my camels. And fortunately, we're told how many camels there are. There are 10 camels to be watered. If you go up to Hogel Zoo and look at the camel exhibit there, it will tell you that a camel can drink 35 gallons of water. Now, there may be different quantities of gallons for different species of camel, but they can drink a lot of water. And the girl who would volunteer to water the camels, to give a man water is a standard act of hospitality in the Middle East. But to water 10 camels, what will that say about her? It's going to say something about the preparation of her life, something about her character, something about who she is, her hospitality, her willingness to work. Things that the years of her life up to this very critical time she has developed. It's going to be an unrehearsed demonstration of character. And Rebecca has no idea when she walks to the well that day that thousands of years of eyes will be watching her if she does it right. If she waters the camels, she becomes the matriarch in the chosen line. And we will all watch her for the rest of our lives, water those camels and demonstrate that character. She doesn't realize that her future husband, who she will marry, hinges on this moment she walks down. Her eternal future hangs in the balance on a decision she will make that day. She comes down. We read, the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin. Neither had any man known the like unto her. And she went down to the well and filled her picture and came up. Notice that, down to the well and came up. You can picture it at the bottom of a hill, but probably it's at the bottom of steps. So it's going to take some effort to get the water. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. There is something wonderful in that image of this young woman going down, up, over to the trough, emptying it, back, down, up, drawing water, willingly, voluntarily, as an act of kindness, selflessness. It says something about her preparation. And the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. Now why does the servant have to wait she has to water all 10, right? If she quits at camel eight and says, whoa, fella, water your own camels. I'm out of here, right? She has to water all 10 camels, and she does. So young women, sometimes I like to say, expect to water camels. You never know who's watching. Uh, I chose to marry my wife on a camel watering moment. I dated her was seriously thinking about it. And I went up to her hometown in southern Alberta. We walked into the church. 
a herd of little children. I don't know what little children come in. A, a primary of little children, what, <laughs> whatever the plural is. All these little children came rushing around. There were so many, they just kind of pushed me away from her. And she knelt down with them. She knew the name of every one of those little children. And she hugged them, and they kissed her and hugged her. And I just saw this tremendous love flowing between this girl I was dating and these little children. And then they left, and I started to move in again. And then a whole bunch of old people. I don't know, what do old people come in? A gaggle of old people, a, a chorus, whatever, old people come in. And they just gathered around her. And she knew every name and communed with them and hugged them. It was an unrehearsed demonstration of a certain quality that I have come to appreciate very deeply in my wife. Her ability to give love and to receive love. As I stood there and watched that, I decided at that moment that this was the girl I wanted to marry. And of all the memories I have of my wife that are very dear to me, that is one of the most dear. So be prepared to water a lot of camels. Now, young men, be prepared to labor seven years. That takes us to the story of Rachel and Jacob. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Jacob comes to his uncle Laban. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for not tell me? What shall thy wages be? And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. That last phrase tells us something about Jacob's belief that his labor was worth what he received for it. Now, for some young men, you're going to have to give all your youth, all those teenage years of living the gospel, of developing character, of creating the magnet for the girl that you'll one day marry. Wilford Woodruff once said, if through our labors in life we could obtain our wife and children in the morning of the resurrection, even if we labored a thousand years in poverty, we would be more than amply paid for that labor. So what is a covenant righteous woman worth? At least a thousand years of labor, Jacob got a bargain. Seven years. Let me try and illustrate that same principle uh, with a personal story. When I was uh, about five years old, I was in a state conference and very bored. And I wanted to go out and play on the cannons that were outside the convention center where we were holding state conference. And I just pestered my mother until finally she said, OK, son, go out. And I went out and climbed upon the cannon, promptly fell off, and cracked my jaw. Came screaming back in a state conference, bleeding all over the place. My most dramatic entrance into a state conference was that particular mo moment. I think my mother, when she stands before the Lord to be judged, will simply say, I raised Michael. And the Lord will say, I understand. Come, <laughs> come right in, because I did more of those kinds of things than uh, I would like to share with you. Well, as a result of that, the jaw crack, we didn't know when it knit together again, the bone, it pinched some tissue and uh, created a cyst. And for the next years of my life, unknowingly, it was eating all the bone of my upper jaw away. In the eighth grade, we discovered that. By that time, the front teeth were dead. I had to have several operations to uh, reconstruct the jaw. And because I was still growing, they couldn't put a bridge in there to replace the teeth. And what that meant was that through grades 8, 9, 10, and most of 11, I had no front teeth, as well as braces. And that didn't create in me this great confidence to go out and conquer the world of dating and courtship and women right away. I had all, all the natural insecurities, and I probably had a few more than natural. Uh, 
girls just frankly scared me. I did not want to date. I liked them, but the thought of picking up a phone and asking one out was just a terrifying experience for me. So I went on one date in high school to get it over with. <laughs> that was my attitude. I got to get it over so that if anybody asked me, have you dated yet? I could say, oh yeah, sure, I've done that. <laughs> I went to BYU as a freshman one date. My roommates dialed the number, thrust the phone in my hand, and said, speak. <laughs> That's how I got. When it came time to go on a mission, I was so relieved. I could postpone the dreaded day of dating for two years. Arm's length, that's a rule I could keep, no problem. I was given a nickname as I was growing up as a result of that. Uh, I was called the frog in high school and college because I had never kissed a princess to be turned into a handsome prince. Now, as a result of uh, those experiences, uh, I, in my mind, anticipated that I would not marry the kind of a girl I dreamed about. I accepted it. I mean, who was I? What was I? I just accepted it that she would not be what I desired. I didn't sense that there was any great unfairness in that. That's just what life had dealt me, and I would have to live with it. When I went back to BYU after my mission, my mother was so terrified that I would crawl into my books and be a hermit and not have a social life that she pulled my roommate aside, who was a bit of a ladies' man, and said to him, I will give you $20 for every date you can get my son on. <laughs> and I used to wonder my, my, why my roommate was so interested in my social life. He was getting $20 a pop for every date he could get me on. Now, I had gained a little more confidence in the mission field. The mission does create confidence for you. But I just accepted. Now, I had in my mind an idea of the kind of a woman I wanted to marry. It was a pretty detailed list, right down to the color of her hair and eyes. I'm partial to green eyes and kind of auburn hair with red highlights. Right down to that fine a description I had in my mind. But I thought, no way, it'll never happen. But when I was 12, I received a patriarchal blessing. And in the blessing, the Lord said this, and I'll paraphrase somewhat. Keep thyself pure and clean from the sins of this generation. And I grew up in the 60s, and the 60s had, was a generation that had a lot of sin, okay, especially in Southern California. And then certain promises were given to me that if I would be pure from my generation's weaknesses and problems, these promises would come. And among those promises was this phrase, in thy purity thou shalt seek and find thy helpmate. Likewise, pure, clean, and undefiled. Now, I remember going into sacrament one day in, at BYU, and I had seen this young woman named Laura Chipman. And you know, everything that I knew about her, everything on my desire list, she had. Even down to the color of her hair and eyes. But who was I to think I could court somebody like that? And I came into sacrament one day, and she got up to bear a testimony. As she was bearing a testimony, the Spirit just whispered those words for my blessing into my heart. Likewise, pure, clean, and undefiled. I turned to my roommate, and I said, I think I'm going to marry that girl. He could see his $20 going away, you know. <laughs> now, I don't think the Lord was saying, there she is, because I'm going to tell you a little bit later that I don't think God makes the decisions for us. What I think he was telling me was that the likewises were in place. Does that make sense? 
I think he was telling me, your preparation is equal to your desire. You kept yourself free from certain things. You tried to develop certain things. So don't sell yourself too short. The likewise is in place. The seven years labor is accomplished. It's time for the wages. And as I look back on some of the things that I avoided in youth and some of the challenges of youth, as I tried to live up to that challenge in my blessing, all that time was worth it. Well, fifth, one final thought on preparation. This is kind of common sense, and, but I really feel I need to say it because so many young people that I've seen and worked with really need this advice. The financial transition from singlehood to marriage is often quite a shock. So prepare financially before you enter that phase of life. Watch debit cards and credit cards. I think it's sometimes a, a bit of a surprise to people, old and young, when I tell them that if you have a credit card and you don't pay the balance off by the end of the month, you are not following the counsel of the church. We talk about getting into debt for houses and education, not shoes and clothes and dinners. And sometimes young people are very free with credit cards. And later on, that can be problematic. Learn how to budget, how to balance a checkbook daily, how to reduce desires, how to tell the difference between wants and needs, how to delay gratification of things that you want, how to save. C.S. Lewis once said, there ought to be some things that we would like to do and can't do because of the amount of money we give to the Lord's programs. So learn how to contribute, to pay tithes, offerings, perpetual education fund. Prepare yourself financially for moving forward. One of the ways that we answer the question, how will I know? is by examining the preparation. One of the ways you know is inherent in the preparation. Has the other person prepared as you have? Are the likewises essentially the same? Are they in place? Have they put into their lives the same valued qualities you've put into yours? Are they naked and unashamed? Do they know where they're going? Are they on the same road you're on? If the preparation is done well, the decision becomes easier and less prone to mistakes. Be careful also of a natural tendency to shortchange either in effort or time the preparation and focus too much on the decision. If the preparation is there, the decision is going to come naturally. And remember that you're going to be working on preparation all your lives. Well, let me shift now a little bit to our second aspect, the actual decision-making process. I'd like to give you not the Ten Commandments of decision-making, but because who am I to give you commandments, <laughs> but maybe the Ten Suggestions that I have noticed and I have learned as I've worked with the young people and watched them struggle with, how will I know? Ten things that I, I hope will, will help you that you might consider and ponder as you begin serious courtship and the decision-making. There's no formula. God works with us differently. Some have greater needs in one area than another. Some won't face some of these concerns. I wish I could give you an easy formula for knowing, but hopefully some of this will help you. 
Suggestion number one, don't make decisions based on fear. Decisions based on fear are almost always bad decisions. Another way I often say that is focus on the fruits of the promised land, not on the giants and the walls that bar your way into it. And that takes us into the book of Numbers and the spies that Moses sent in to watch the promised land, to see what it was like. Remember, there were 12 of them and they went and they brought back two different reports. They cut down a cluster of grapes and bear it on a pole between the two. And they came back to Moses to say, we came into the land whither thou sendest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Look, it's wonderful. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people. They are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report. All the people that we saw are men of great stature. We saw the giants there, the sons of Anak, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. Now, if you look at that little story, it is so true in so many areas of life. There are two things the spies could look at as they went, the fruits of the land and the obstacles to obtaining the fruits. Two, Caleb and Joshua focused on the fruits, the milk, the honey, the pomegranates, the grapes. Ten of them focused on the walls and the giants that would bar it. And a decision was made based on fear, not on faith. And so they wandered. There are many young people who are making decisions based on fear, and they wander, and they delay when they could be enjoying the fruits of the promised land of marriage. Here are some of the fears. Fear of rejection. Fear of hurting someone we have come to care about if things don't work out. Fear there is someone better and you'll sell yourself short. Fear there's not enough money or a job to support a family or finish education. Fear of losing freedom, independence, solitude, control of your own life. Fear of responsibility and commitment. Fear you will fall out of love after marriage. Fear of making a mistake. Fear you will never get married. Lots of giants, lots of walls we look at. I have discovered that boys tend to look at the walls more than girls look at. Girls tend to look at the fruits. They, those can be interchangeable. If you think about it, where does the rest of the story come? Not in numbers. The story of the spies ends in the book of Joshua with the very first city the children of Israel come to conquer. What city was that? Jericho. And what was the one single feature of the town of Jericho that is emphasized in that story? The wall. And what happens to the wall? It comes down. That which they feared so much, God removes for them. I think it's the same as we make decisions to go forward into marriage. God will help us bring the walls down and the obstacles. Don't make a decision based on fear. Focus on the fruits and go forward. Second uh, suggestion in the decision-making process. The Lord won't make the decision for you, but I have found a lot of people want him to. Now, there's only one road to God, and we need to be on that road, but there are many you can walk it with and walk it happily with. It's your decision. It's a decision primarily of preference, not necessarily right or wrong, the right person. The question I think that we put in our mind is, can I form an eternal relationship with this individual? Do I have a good chance? 
Are the magnets compatible? Each of my children, uh, as they have approached the marriage decision, have come to me and they ask the question that sometimes we ask of God. They say, Dad, should I marry this boy? Should I marry this girl? Now, how is a father supposed to answer that question? I'm not sure they'd be pleased if I said yes or no. And I think it's the same with our Father in heaven. Should I marry this person? Now, I think if I'm going to make a mistake, I'm a father is much more likely to say no than yes. I sit down with my children and we go over the list. It's a rather unromantic thing, but we go over the list. And I ask them questions like this. Have you considered the financial habits of this person? Do they have sound financial habits? Do you have complementary personality traits? What's his character or her character like? Their spiritual commitment. How long has that commitment been there? What's their activity level? What are their educational goals? Family background. How do they treat brothers, sisters, mother, father, younger siblings, brothers? What are their goals and aspirations? Family size. Do they bring out the best in you when you're with them? What's their maturity level, their employment desires, their hobbies, their interests? How do they spend their free time when they don't have anything to do? What do they want to do? What are their parenting skills, physical attraction? We go through those kinds of specifics. And if there isn't anything that I see in that as they answer those questions, I would answer, well, I don't see why the two of you can't have a very positive relationship and form an eternal marriage together. But I can't make the decision for you. That's a decision you'll have to make. But I approve of the decision. Now, if there's areas that there's concern, I may say there's a red flag here in the spiritual commitment or the financial uh, responsibility or the way you've watched them treat their family, their mother, their father. I might wave some flags for them and then they'll have to decide, well, that's a flag I can live with or that's one I can't. God's not going to make the decision for you as much as we would like him to. Now he can confirm it but a confirmation doesn't say a marriage is going to be celestial. It says it has the potential for it. Third uh, suggestion. Beware of demanding an answer by fire of God. Most of you know that story of Elijah when he goes out discouraged and he prays. And the Lord says to Elijah, go forth and stand upon the mount. And the Lord passed by and a great and a strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Sometimes young people want earthquake answers, fire answers, great wind answers. But God generally answers in the still small voice. Probably the most important walk I ever took in my life, I didn't realize the girl I loved was watching. It was a snowy night, it was general conference time, I was walking back from having attended the priesthood session. I had taken my scriptures and was holding them under my arm and I was kind of lost in thought as I sometimes can get. And I just walked past her window on the way to my apartment. She just happened to be at the window and watched me go by. No great earthquake, no great wind, no great fire in her apartment as she watched that walk. Just a very simple whisper of the Spirit that said, this is a man who loves his Father in heaven. You can go forward. No great tumultuous sign, 
just somebody walking in the snow. I've been very grateful for that priesthood session ever since. Fourth suggestion on making the decision. Almost everyone gets cold feet. Just expect it. When those times come and you get cold feet about an individual, ask yourself this. This is what I asked my children. It's what I asked myself when I got cold feet. Are you nervous about a specific thing or just the whole idea of marriage? God usually deals in specifics. And so if it's just kind of a, oh, I'm really uneasy and nervous, it just may be cold feet. If it's the Spirit pretty prompting you away from a, a, a dating situation or a marriage, it's going to be specific. These are the reasons. When I had a little bit of a cold feet time, uh, I got healed really quick. I'm not saying God sent this dream. I don't know. It may have just been my own mind. But I dreamed one night that I saw my wife walking into the temple in a white wedding dress, holding hands with my roommate. And he was going to marry her. <laughs> and the thought that somebody else was going to be, able to be married to that girl was, uh, that was enough. My feet warmed up really, really fast <laughs> after that experience. Fifth suggestion, the time is rarely right. The time is rarely right. Focus on the person, not the timing. Now, the timing isn't absolutely unimportant, but far too often we, we worry about finishing school, we worry about jobs, we worry about responsibilities and commitments, and and the time is really right. So many students have come to me later and said, I just didn't feel ready when an opportunity came, and sometimes the opportunity is gone. I remember one particular instance, a very, very sad, uh, a young man who had dated this girl for years. I mean, in high school they dated casually. He went on his mission, and she wrote, came back. She always anticipated she was going to marry him. He always anticipated uh, he was going to marry her. We just kept waiting. He needed to get through school and then medical school. He just And this girl was so patient. She was just a gem. And she waited and she kept wanting and encouraging him. We can work it out. Oh, he would get around to it. One day she came into the office and she said, I'm engaged. And I said, wonderful, finally. <laughs> and she said, not to. And she mentioned his name. She had found somebody else. The next day, the boy came in, devastated, with his mother. <laughs> Wanted me to try and talk this girl into changing her mind and marrying the original boy. And I said, what, what, what do you want me to do? I, I, can't, I can't do that. I talked to her later, and she said this. I'll never forget it. I finally decided I wanted someone who could make a decision and move forward in faith. All those years taught me something about, she stated his name. The time is rarely right. That young man is still unmarried and almost 40 now. Sixth suggestion. The name of the game is courtship, not hanging out. Now, I could say that more strongly. I would say it this way. Hanging out was invented by Lucifer in hell because he really doesn't want people to get together. I don't know who invented this idea of hanging out, but I'm sure it didn't come from God. There is one rule from For the Strength of Youth when you're in Saying young single adult, college age, post mission, you get to avoid, you get to ignore. That's the don't pair off rule. That's for high school, not for courtship period. We are trying to court. Now you need some group socializing, I understand that, but this is a means to an end. It is not the end in itself. And young men, since the advantage of choice is yours, the responsibility of action is also yours to move forward. Seventh suggestion. 
It is possible that God can say yes to one and no to the other. Now, that's sometimes a bit of a surprise to people, and I don't know how to say it any better than that. There are times, even as I, I think of my own experiences, when a young man and a young woman who've maybe been dating, and I know them well, and they trying to make that decision, how will I know? And, and maybe the young man comes in and he talks. He says, do you think she's the right girl for me? And there are times I've said, boy, if you can get that young lady to go through the temple doors with you, you are one of the luckiest men on earth because she is a magnificent woman. And that same day, the young woman could come into the office and say, do you think I should marry him? And I might say, well, have you considered these things? Now, if I do that as an individual, I would suppose that the Lord could do that too. And it doesn't have to mean that the person is deficient in any way or that God disapproves of him. It just may mean that somebody could be very good for another and that other not very good for them. Does that make sense? Sometimes uh, we, we kind of blackmail almost one another. I've prayed, I've got this answer, and the Lord says, you're the one for me. And, and that can be absolutely true. You don't have to doubt that revelation. But it, another answer may be going to the other person. It's possible that God can say yes to one and no to another. The eighth suggestion. Be careful of the images of the world. It is so easy to get wrong ideas, and youth are so impressionable. Uh, romantic ideals we get from television and music and uh, radio, the movies, may never match reality. And expectations may be too high. One of my favorite statements of Sister Hinckley was when she was asked, what's the key to a successful marriage? And her response was, low expectations. Now there's uh, some unique dangers, I think, for men and some unique dangers for women in the image that we tend to portray sometimes in our mind. Often for men, it's a physical image. And pornography is a terrible problem in creating expectations that very few women can match. There's a wonderful quote in the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. The whole book, Screw Tape Letters, is about a devil trying to teach another devil how to destroy Christian lives. And this is what he says is one of the plans they are engineering down there in hell. Considering that this was written in the 50s, uh, there's certain prophetic power in what C.S. Lewis wrote. Screwtape is speaking, remember he's a devil. He says, we have engineered a great increase in the license which society allows to the representation of the nude and its exhibition on the stage or on the bathing beach. The real women are made to appear firmer and more slender than nature allows a full grown woman to be. As a result, we are more and more directing the desires of men to something which does not exist or rarely exists, making the role of the eye in sexuality more and more important and at the same time making its demands more and more impossible. What follows you can easily forecast. William Butler Yeats wrote a, a little tiny poem speaking on this particular issue when he said, maybe the bride bed brings despair for each an imagined image brings and finds a real image there. So young men, be careful of the image that the world is trying to present of what womanhood is. It's a distorted image. I have noticed with young women that sometimes their image is an overly mature spiritual priesthood kind of an individual that often isn't developed until later in life. You want the potential. You need to look at spirituality. But that does take time for that to develop. 
And there has to be a balance in that kind of an image of mature spirituality that every young woman wants and should have the opportunity to be married to. Suggestion nine. Ordinances and covenants bring an increase of spirit and maturity by their very nature. And without those ordinances and covenants, you may plateau. I've noticed young people plateau. They, young men plateau differently than young women. There's a big difference in spiritual maturity between a young man, senior in high school or a freshman in college, and a boy who's just been endowed going to the mission field. That covenant, that ordinance, increases the spiritual maturity. It's almost as if the Lord says, you're willing to make covenants with me. I'm gonna give you the spiritual power that you need to keep those covenants. And they lift themselves up a level with that covenant. Now they come home from their missions, and they're 22, right? And they're gonna stay 22 until they make that next covenant. There's a lot of 30-year-old, 22-year-olds out there. Okay? They don't need to decline, they don't stagnate, I don't wanna use negative words, they just kinda of plateau. They need that next covenant. There's a big difference between a young man off a mission and a young man who's just been married in the temple, generally speaking. They've made that covenant, it boosts them to a higher level of spirituality. Some men, young men, just get into what I call the Peter Pan problem. They never want to grow up. And they're just going to stay at that level. And they live in a never-never land. They never-never want to commit. They never-never want to make a decision. They never-never want family responsibility. Now, there is a certain uh, leeway we have to give young men. Uh, one of them is that hopefully young women will understand, the marriage decision for a boy is an increased responsibility. He feels weight coming on to him. He's got someone to take care of. The marriage decision with a girl, a lot of times, lifts a weight somewhat. It's the big decision, the big, the big moment of her life, and when she's married, there is a kind of a relief. But for a young man, often there is an additional weight. Hence, it's kind of natural that they maybe hesitate some. We need to understand that and give them the benefit of the doubt. There's also something in how long they've looked to marriage. I can remember when I was growing up, all I looked at was mission. I never looked past mission. When I got off my mission, I, I was lost. I thought, now what? Because as I grew up, the church and my mother was always saying, mission, mission, mission. When a young woman grows up, what is always placed before her? Temple, temple, temple. Now, young women tend to plateau by going into a waiting mode or over-anxiety about whether or not it's going to happen or when it's going to happen. And sometimes that becomes crippling and they don't move forward in their life. Uh, continue education, be involved, right? And not plateau by that constant thinking about it and worrying about it and whining it and wondering about it. There's a beautiful story in the Garden of Eden with the two trees uh, and Lucifer's approach and God's approach to the trees of the garden. I, the Lord God, commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Notice how open and positive that is. You can eat of this tree, this tree, this tree, this tree, this tree, this tree. This tree. God wants us to focus our lives on the things that we have and can do. Then we'll live contented lives. Lucifer comes and says, Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Lucifer wants us to focus on the things that we don't have and can't do. And if I focus on the things that I don't have and can't do, I'm going to live a frustrated, angry life. So if the marriage opportunity hasn't come yet for a young woman, focus on the many trees, the things that you have and you can do, not on the one. The last suggestion. There are more Davids than Josephs. Now what I mean by that is David Bathsheba and Joseph and Potiphar's wife. 
when uh, Jesus told Peter at the Last Supper that all the disciples were going to leave him, Peter didn't believe that was possible. He said, though all men deny you or are offended because of thee, yet will I never. He just felt he was stronger than anybody else. And because he felt that way, on the night that Christ was arrested, he went to Caiaphas' palace, which was the most dangerous place he could possibly be. And there the circumstances came about that he did that which he conceived impossible a few hours before. He would deny Christ not once but three times. And Jesus tells him that before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. He's saying, Peter, you're not as strong as you think you are. Now, sometimes young people say, though all other young people dating or engaged might have moral problems, yet, well, we never were strong enough. And they may allow themselves to go to Caiaphas' palace to find themselves in circumstances that might be tempting. There are more Davids than Joseph's. David was a good man. He was not an immoral man. He was a good man. Most of us don't have the courage to flee and get ourselves out as Joseph did. When I was a boy, my uncle put me on a horse about five or six. As we were returning to the barn, the horse, knowing he was going to be unsaddled and get the bucket of oats, took off at a full gallop, ears laid back, and away he went. And I was terrified. And I did a very stupid thing. I dropped the reins and grabbed onto the saddle horn and just held on for dear life. And when he felt those reins drop, Away he went. My uncle came riding up like John Wayne, grabbed the reins, jerked the horse to a stop, and I scrambled off vowing I would never get on a horse ever again. He put me back on the horse, gave me the reins, and said, you hold the reins. You make the horse do what you want it to do. Now, I think it's interesting that when Alma counseled his son about passion, he said, bridle all thy passions that you may be filled with love. And bridle makes me think of a horse. Passion is like a horse. It's powerful. It's good. But if I give it its head, it's going to run with me. So I keep it in control. Alma says that the bridling of passion increases love. The world says just the opposite, that the expression of passion is an expression of love. There are more Davids than Joseph's. Don't go to Caiaphas' palace. Hold tight to the reins. Now in conclusion, I'd like to suggest two final questions. You've made the decision. You've found the person. You've gone through all the preparation and you feel comfortable. I would ask myself two final questions now. The first one is, are you in love with a person or with a feeling? Make sure you're in love with a person, not a feeling. The feeling of being in love is a powerful feeling. I was an English major. When I had it, I wrote poetry to my wife, mimicking every style of every English author. Wonderful, euphoric feeling, but it's a feeling. And I have to make sure I'm not in love with that feeling, that I'm in love with a person. C.S. Lewis described it best this way. Being in love is a good thing, but it is not the best thing. There are many things below it, but there are also things above it. You cannot make it the basis of a whole life. It is a noble feeling, but it is still a feeling. Now, no feeling can be relied on to last in its full intensity or even to last at all. Knowledge can last, principles can last, habits can last, but feelings come and go. And in fact, whatever people say, the state called being in love usually does not last. If the old fairy tale ending, they lived happily ever after, is taken to mean they felt for the next 50 years exactly as they felt the day before they were married, then it says what probably never was nor ever could be true and would be highly undesirable if it were. Who could bear to live in that excitement for even five years? What would become of your work, your appetite, your sleep, your friendships? But of course, ceasing to be in love need not mean ceasing to love. 
Love in the second sense. Love as distinct from being in love is not merely a feeling. And then there's this glorious sentence he uses. It is a deep unity maintained by the will and deliberately strengthened by habit, reinforced in Christian marriages by the grace which both partners ask and receive from God. They can have this love for each other even at those moments when they do not like each other, as you love yourself even when you do not like yourself. They can retain this love even when each would easily, if they allowed themselves, be in love with someone else. Being in love first moved them to promise fidelity. This quieter love enables them to keep the promise. It is on this love that the engine of marriage is run. Being in love was the explosion that started it. Make sure you're in love with a person and not a feeling. The last question I would ask myself, will God seal an empty jar? Will God seal an empty jar? We focus on temple marriage so much in the church that often I have noticed young people feel that it's the end instead of the beginning of the journey. And that if I just get the temple marriage, I have it. Celestial marriages are not made at the altar. They're made in life. What you get at the altar is a jar. Occasionally I've given a jar as a gift. A nice looking jar, right? A vessel. Okay? That's what God gives you. The present he gives you at your wedding is an empty jar. Now you've seen your mother's bottle fruit, I'm sure. Does she ever seal an empty jar? And what word do we talk about in terms of the church with marriages? We want it sealed. But I have to fill it with fruit first. So God gives a couple at the temple a jar, a vessel, and he says, here is the potential for an eternal marriage. Fill the jar with all your love and your compromise and your forgiveness and your sharing and your life together. Every good fruit, every desirable thing, just fill the jar to the top and one day you'll come to the end of life and you'll bring that jar before me and you'll say, we want to preserve it all. Seal our marriage. But nobody seals an empty jar. May the Lord bless you, bless all of us, that we will prepare properly and decide correctly so we can kneel at that altar and receive that vessel. And then may you spend a lifetime filling it with all the sweet things of your life together, that one day you'll have a celestial as well as a temple marriage. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. This concludes this presentation of How Will I Know? Making the Marriage Decision, a talk by S. Michael Wilcox. Recorded and edited by Kenny Hodges. This has been a production of the Deseret Book Audio Library.